Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning message. So good to have you with us today. God bless you. We're praying for you as usual. We always say that, but I just want you to know it. We are lifting you to the Lord in prayer. Uh, let's remember the families who have lost their loved ones recently. Uh, continue to pray for those uh, who are uh, are going through uh, uh, difficult times, such as sickness and other things. Uh, so let's always lift each other to the Lord and our church family. Certainly uh, pray for our, our nation and our leaders and uh, all that's going on in our world. We need to, to be praying certainly today. As we continue our series of uh, messages from the book of Nehemiah, uh, if you have your Bible there with you, you can turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. We'll be back in chapter 2, picking up where we left off last week. Uh, this week, and we'll begin with verse 11 of Nehemiah chapter 2. From the diary of a preacher, John Wesley, uh, comes these words, and I find a bit of humor in this, but uh, the, the main thing that I want you to get today is that persistence pays off. Persistence pays off. If we're willing to stay in there and work through things, God will bless. Eventually, on his time, our blessings will come. But listen to what John Wesley said. Sunday morning, uh, May the 5th, preached in St. Anne's, was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday afternoon, May the 5th, preached in St. John's. Deacon said, get out and stay out. Sunday morning, May the 12th, preached in St. Jude's, can't go back there either. Sunday morning, May the 19th, preached in St. Somebody Else's, Deacons called a special meeting and I couldn't return. Sunday evening, May the 19th, preached on the street, kicked off the street. Sunday morning, May the 26th, preached in a meta, chased out of the meta by a bull that was turned loose during the service. Sunday morning, June the 2nd, preached out at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. Sunday afternoon, June the 2nd, preached in a pastor. 10,000 people came to hear the word of God. Persistence. Now, of course, John Wesley has been decades ago, but the same applies today, does it not? He could have been discouraged on the first, asked not to come back anymore, but he wasn't. He could have been discouraged when the deacons of St. John said to get out and stay out, but he was persistent. And his persistence, his perseverance paid off in that when God provided a pastor, a cow pastor for him to preach in, 10,000 people came out to hear his message. Oh, perseverance, persistence, it pays off. Perseverance, never quitting, always pays. Thousands upon thousands came to Christ during John Wesley's ministry. Perseverance in prayer will move the hand of God into the lives of other people. Certainly, we have seen that the last two weeks in our messages from Nehemiah. No matter if the task before us seems to be as big as the tallest mountains in the world and the opposition to that task seems to surround us like a thousand roaring lions, be determined, seek God's will, and he will see that his will is accomplished in the task that he has set before you. As Dr. V. Raymond Edmond says, it's always too soon to quit. Sometimes I have to read that a time or two, but that's true. 
it's always too soon to quit what God has asked us to do. Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. And again, thank you for being with us this morning. So I came to Jerusalem. This, of course, is Nehemiah. And was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. There was only the one that he was riding on, no other animals. Verse 13. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley. Here he is now in Jerusalem, and he's looking around the city, okay, at night time. Even before the dragon well and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. It was so torn down, he couldn't even get through. Verse 15. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, now he makes the secret known what he's going to do. Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, I love this, let us rise up and build. So they strengtheneth their hands for this good work. But as we talked last week, there's always obstacles, and a lot of times those obstacles are people. Verse 19, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tob uh, Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them, and said unto them, Friends, when we know God's will and we're doing God's will, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Could we pray? Thank you, Lord, for Nehemiah. Thank you for his life. Thank you for the words that we find in the Bible that encourage us to persevere and to be persistent in the things that you've called us to do. Many times obstacles lie in our way. A lot of times uh, it's people. And Father, we just pray in Jesus' name across our world, even this morning, if there's obstacles standing in the way of that true believer, that true servant of God, who is trying to bring the message of hope, the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ into a lost and dying world, wherever they may be today, we pray that those obstacles would be removed. And Lord, they would persevere in the work of the kingdom. For one of these days, we're going to stand before you and all of us want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us now as we go into your word for a little while this morning. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for helping us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
being led by the ever-present Spirit of God, Nehemiah spent three days likely trying to rest from his nearly 1,000-mile journey from Shushan to Jerusalem. When he began his examination of the walls, he went in secret at night, taking only a few men with him, not to, so not to draw the attention to himself, nor this plan that God had given him of rebuilding the walls of the city. He did this to keep the enemies, the obstacles, and opponents of his task in the dark, so to speak, as long as he could. Any good leader, if you think about it, any good leader will patiently look at a situation uh, and weigh his options before broadcasting his plan. Nehemiah knew there would be obstacles. He had already seen those in Sanballat and Tobiah. But he knew there would be obstacles to his task, so he wanted to get the plan into place before it was made public. Certainly, he prayed for God's guidance as he was in the beginning stages of the most heartfelt task of rebuilding the walls of his beloved Jerusalem. In today's world, there are doors open for the church. There are doors open for pastors, preachers, evangelists to carry the gospel into places where there is certain opposition to it. That's why many Christian organizations that are in certain places are rarely heard of or advertised. But praise the Lord, they're there. Yes, church, we have an enemy. Always know that we have an enemy working against the things that we try to do. The devil himself. And he has many in his evil army to try to help him slam the door on the church's task of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ around our world. At this very hour, no doubt about it. At this very hour, our world, uh, in our world, there are servants of God who are working in secret and in danger to get the gospel message out so maybe one more precious soul might be saved. They have a passion to reach men and women and little boys and girls, sharing the hope that they have in a Savior's love. They care like Nehemiah cared as he prayed and fasted for months. They believe in what God has called them to do as Nehemiah did as he put everything on the line when he made his request to the king to go home and rebuild his beloved city. They've planned for their task very carefully just as we see that Nehemiah has. We need to pray that God will keep his hand of protection and direction upon our missionaries in whom we support with our money and prayer. They get up every morning with the possibility of persecution coming into their lives. Always pray for those that we support. Monetarily, prayerfully, always pray for them. Nehemiah was being very cautious by investigating the city and the destruction of it and the needs of it by night to keep Sanballat, who was probably the governor of Samaria, and Tobiah, likely the governor of Ammon, from hearing or seeing what he was up to. And in some of those verses in our scripture text today, 12, uh, 13 uh, through 16 maybe, we see that the route that Nehemiah and a few of his men took that evening to examine the destruction of the walls. He entered at the gate of the valley, the Bible tells us, and went to the dragon well and even examined the walls near the gate where the sewer system exited the city and saw that they were broken down. Those walls and the gates were burned up. We see also there, as we read in our text today, that Nehemiah goes on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, and because of the destruction, it was so great a destruction there that there was not even a place big enough for the animal he was riding to crawl through. Then he went up to the brook, the brook of Kidron, and examined the walls there. The Bible tells us he returns to the gate of the valley where he began his trip of examining the walls of the city, and all of this was done 
under the cloak of darkness. You see, God had provided the, this day and this time for him to be able to go and examine what needed to be done. Look at what verse 16 says, And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. They didn't even know those top officials and the, the remnant of people that had gone back to Jerusalem didn't know what he was doing. Neither had I as yet told to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. I hadn't told them yet. So in reading these words of Nehemiah this morning, a thought came to mind. Nehemiah had traveled hundreds of miles. He had given up a life in the palace and a job that was of the highest importance, the king's cupbearer, of course, we've been talking about. Obviously, he was living at least around luxury and probably living in it, if the truth be known. What would drive a man? The question arises, what would drive a man or a person to give up all of the comforts he had at the palace to travel for weeks, knowing by the words of his own brother the terrible situation that awaited him in Jerusalem? In our own day, 2020, what would move men and women in such a way that they would give up the comforts of their home and move their families to some third world country to share Christ with people they have never, ever seen before. Look at verse 17 for a moment. This will give us an answer to that question. Then said I unto them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. What has caused men and women down through the history to give up everything and put their lives on the line as servants of the living God? Because they see and realize, listen, they see and realize and care about the distress this lost world has always been in and is still in even as we speak today. That's why we care about people. Church, we need to care about the lost world that we live in. One of these days, judgment will take place and there will be, yes, millions lost forever if they do not hear the word of the Lord, repent and accept Christ as Savior. Nehemiah saw that the Jews' beloved city of Jerusalem, the holy city, was laying waste and the gates were burned up. Men and women today, our missionaries that we support as Southern Baptists, there's a lot more that we support, but as Southern Baptists, about 5,000 of them all over the world with families. Men and women today sacrifice their lives seeing that the world in which we live is also lying waste. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look on the television or the internet or read in the newspaper what a time that we're living in. Not only in the physical sense do we see suffering across our world as there's famine and starvation and disease and terror and all of those things, not only the physical part, but much more in the spiritual sense. We see today that people across our globe has no, has no need, they feel, for the things of Jehovah God. In verse 17, Nehemiah has now put off the secrecy of his plan to rebuild the walls of the city and was trying to get people on board to work in this great task God had set before him and the people. The city had been a shame, a reproach. That's what that means. Nehemiah said, let us not be a reproach or be a, a shame anymore for decades. And now God had sent a leader in Nehemiah with an urgent message of hope to encourage a downtrodden people and, and uh, that, that they could once again be blessed of the Lord and, and see their beloved city rebuilt. Dear church, 
Listen, church, today we have an urgent message. Everyday people are dying lost and headed for an eternity, separated from God in an awful place of eternal judgment. Pastors are trying to motivate churches and, and get the message out before it is everlasting too late. Roger Storms, pastor of First Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona, tells this story. I like this. One Sunday, a car had broken down in the alley behind our facilities, behind the church building there, and the driver of the car had jacked up the car and crawled underneath to work on the problem. Suddenly, we heard him scream for help. The jack had slipped and the car had come down on top of him. Someone shouted, call 911, and a couple people ran for the phone. Several other men gathered around the large car and strained to lift it off the trap man. Nurses from our congregation were rounded up and brought to the scene. Somehow, I'll tell you how, by the hand of God, somehow the men were able to ease the car's weight off the man and he was pulled free. Our nurses checked him over. He was scratched up and shaken, but otherwise okay. Wow, that would be frightful, no doubt, would it not? When this man was in peril, people did all they could to help, didn't they, as the story goes. The men of the church, the nurses in the church, people with the phone, they did everything they could to help this fella, didn't they? Risking themselves, inconveniencing themselves, whatever, listen, whatever was necessary to save this man, they were ready and willing to try to get him out from under that car. How we need, church, how we need the same attitude when it comes to rescuing those in the greatest peril the danger of losing their soul eternally. Nehemiah brought an urgent message to the people, didn't he? Urgent. May we, dear church family, carry the message of much greater urgency to our neighbors in the area in which God has placed us in this life. We need to begin to see the gospel message as a message of urgency. Friends, today people are dying of a lot of different causes. We see a new cause in our world, this pandemic that has taken the lives of many. I hope that every one of them knew the Lord. But my friends, we see the urgency of our message, don't we? But let us also notice in the scripture text today, that we have great power in overcoming obstacles that stand in the way of delivering our message of hope. Verse 18 says this again. I'd like to read it to you again. Then I told them, told the people there, his fellow uh, Israelites, he told them of the hand of my God was good upon me. Friends, when the hand of God is upon us, when he's blessing a person or a missionary or whoever it is to do the work of God, that work will be accomplished. He has blessed our church at Lewis Fork so abundantly. We're still reaching out into our world in a lot of different ways. Even during this time of social distancing and all of that, we are still reaching people for Christ. And thank you, for your generous giving and your willingness to do whatever we can to keep things going. Then I told them, verse 18 again, of the hand of my God which was good upon me, and uh, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me, the king gave Nehemiah his blessings, didn't he? And they said, let us rise up and build, praise the Lord, isn't that a, a wonderful statement right there? As Nehemiah was motivating those people there, they said, well, let us rise up and build church. That's the attitude we need to have today, is it not? So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Oh, was Nehemiah a motivator 
He motivated them by telling them it was not by his power they would accomplish this monumental, monumental task, but it was of the hand of God which had moved upon Nehemiah and the heart of the king. Were they encouraged? You better believe it. What was their response to Nehemiah? They answered, let us rise up and build. What glorious words that must have been to Nehemiah. And build they would, but again, not without opposition. The devil can't stand anything for the Lord, can he? But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn. They made fun of them for thinking, build these torn down walls? What are you thinking? And look at what it says, and despised us. Oh, that's just like the devil and his bunch, isn't it? They despise the things of God and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? But look at what Nehemiah said with his bold rebuke to these naysayers. Verse, the first part of verse 20. Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. He didn't say, I'm smart, I'm, a, I'm a, a great engineer of building walls. He didn't say anything like that. He gave all credit and praise and honor to the God of heaven. For it would be by his power this thing would be accomplished. Friends, today, if we accomplish anything for God, it will be by his power. We're weak vessels, but we become strong vessels when we have the God of the universe working in and through us out into a lost and dying world. Lewis Fort Church, the God of heaven, has prospered us, and if we will trust him, he will continue, praise the Lord, to do so. There was a key element to the success of Nehemiah's calling, and that element is the same for us today, and that element is faith. And faith produces perseverance to keep on going, even in the face of trouble. And perseverance produces awesome results. God's word has set a task before us to be witnesses to others by sharing our faith in a personal testimony, in acts of kindness to one another, and being willing to sacrifice our own desires and wants for the needs of other people. Nehemiah had led his people to do this. And one of the other reasons Nehemiah was such a great leader, let's look at, at the rest of that verse 20. Therefore we, what did he say? We, therefore we. Who is included in we? Nehemiah is. His servants will arise and build. Man, I love to see a leader no matter if it's a pastor, no matter if it's a leader in a business or an organization or a country or whatever, a leader who will set the example by working alongside his people. He was a great leader because he didn't mind getting his hands dirty. And we saw that as he went by night to examine the, the, the destruction of the walls of his beloved city. He didn't mind getting his hands dirty for the work of the Lord, did he? And what happened to those who opposed this great work? Well, Nehemiah gave them a prophecy. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial. They're not going to know anything about you in Jerusalem. Sand Ballad and, and, uh, or any of the others uh, would not prosper for trying to be an obstacle in the way of God's work. Neither will any of us today. They had nothing coming to them but judgment. We have an urgent message today, dear church family, to tell the world there are thousands right here in our own county, in our own community, that have never responded to the gospel message. And you may say, well, preacher, what, what, can, we, what can we do uh, what, what, what can we do? Many may be asking, especially now that, that, that we can't get close to people during this pandemic. I mean, we can pray, certainly, just as Nehemiah did, can't we? We need to pray without ceasing, even if we don't see immediate results, just keep praying. 
all of us can pray that God would use Lewis Fork Church and any of us to, to do something for the kingdom work, even during this time. And my friend, the number one thing we can do is we saw in the first chapter of Nehemiah, Nehemiah prayed for four months and fasted that the king would allow him to go and rebuild the walls of that beloved city, Jerusalem. And he did. God moved his heart, you see. And we can see God work even in our day today. One day, great evangelist George Mueller began praying for five of his friends. After many months, one of them came to the Lord. Ten years later, two others were converted. It took 25 years before the fourth man was saved. Mueller persevered in prayer. Friends, can you imagine praying 25 years for someone? We need to, don't we? We need to. Mueller persevered in prayer until his death for the fifth friend. And throughout, listen, throughout those 52 years, he never gave up hoping that he would accept Christ. His faith was, re listen, dear friends, his faith was rewarded for soon after Mueller's funeral, the last one was saved. Perseverance, persistence in prayer, living a life dedicated to God. That's what he wants today, isn't it? We see that clearly in the task God set before Nehemiah. Oh, what a wonderful example this grand prophet is to us today. Thank you so much again for joining with us. And God bless you until we speak again.